turn in your Bibles this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, the last few times that I've had the privilege and the opportunity to stand and share a small portion of the Word of God, I've been looking at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, it seems like as of lately, the renewal of the second coming of Christ as far as preaching has, I don't know, come about, if I can say it to you like that. I'm going into different churches and I may listen to this preacher or this Sunday school teacher. And it's good news, isn't it? Amen. It's good news. I, you know, think about how we actually saw prophecy in one sense of word before our very eyes in 1980. And what I mean by that, you're saying, what are you talking about here? Whoa, hold on here. And that's when Mr. Reagan looked at Gorbachev. I say in 1980, it may have been in the 80s. But it's when Mr. Reagan looked at Gorbachev and said, tear that wall down. And that wall had to come down in order for uh, Gomer, which is Germany, to be reunited together as one nation, where they will come down with Kush and with uh, the people of the north, with his Russia, uh, Gog and Magog, and they'll come down uh, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And so, you know, we're in the closing times, if you understand what I'm saying. And that's good news. That's, uh, you know, good news that we're going home. Amen. We're going to get a glorified body. We're going to have peace forevermore and delight after the judgment seat of Christ. But we will stand there. And that leads us to our thought today. If you'll look with me, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. As you think about the judgment seat of Christ, Number one, let me just say to you, there's the subjects. And what I mean by the subjects is it is believers and believers only. Uh, there's actually, I think it's five judgments in the New Testament. That would be the judgment of the nations. That would be the judgment of the angels. There will be the, or there is the self-judgment of the believer for what we judge ourselves. We should not be judged of the Lord, you understand. And then we also see uh, the judgment seat of Christ, and then Revelations 20, 11 through 15, the great white throne judgment of God. There the lost will come, and they'll stand before God, and then to be cast off into the lake of fire. And so as we think about it, this judgment is just for believers. That's for us. It's not a question to our salvation. It's not that we lose our salvation or we uh, don't have salvation anymore. This is in reference to our works for Christ, what we've done on this side of eternity, uh, we will receive crowns. And so may I say to you, secondly, there's the time of the judgment, and this time is after the church is called out. Uh, for the Lord will give the rapture, we'll hear the trumpet, and we'll go home, and then uh, will go before the judgment seat of Christ. There's two thoughts, let me say this to you, about the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is immediately after the judgment seat of Christ. Some believe that it will take place in heaven, and then some believe that it will take place at the beginning of the millennium. I personally, my own self, believe it will take place immediately uh, after the judgment seat of Christ. After the marriage supper, we mount up with him, we come back with him on white horses, Zechariah 14, 4, it splits open and he puts an end to Gentile world domination. Clear as mud, isn't it? Amen. All right, but thank you, sis. I needed that vote of confidence. Amen. But as you think about it, it's after we're caught up, the rapture takes place. May I say to you thirdly, the place. Well, it'll be at the Bema seat or the judgment seat, and this will take place in the air. And then the basis of the judgment, again, that's for our works and the results. They'll either be reward or loss. Now, as we look at it, look with me and think with me as he says it. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. 
Now that's not the case for us. Each and every Christian has the ability at the judgment seat of Christ to receive crowns. You know, it's not a race where only one, one would win and him alone. And in the Grecian games and the uh, Isle of Itamus, I believe it was uh, in Corinth, there was several different great games. But as we think about it, we'll all have that opportunity. That's good news. While we're breathing, while we have life in this body, if he's not called us home, we'll get to stand before him because, or excuse me, we'll have the uh, uh, awesomeness but we also have the privilege of receiving from him the crowns because we labored for him. That's one of the reasons why we strive to labor. And then if you'll notice with me, let me give you three things to think about today and I'll be done here in just a second. I pulled up my computer because I've been working on it. There's the decision to run. Notice with me, he said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. You know, when you think about this, I therefore so run not as ignorantly is what he's talking about. Uh, I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. And he says, for our lot affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight in glory, while we look not on those things which are seen, but on those things which are not seen. For those things which are seen are temporal, but those things which are not seen they are eternal. Now, we've got that opportunity, so let's run, and let's run that race. But let me give you about four things to think about. We've got to run that race knowing the rules. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. There's what we might think, but then there's what God's Word says. You know, when the runners would run the race or when the boxers would box, and, and he says in one place here in this passage, uh, let me find it. He says uh, that he not as one that beateth the air. And before the games and before they would they would exercise. You know, I think about fighters today. They'll come out and it's a championship, you know, and all of that. And you've probably seen Rocky 12, 13, 14, and 84. And, you know, I'm joking when I say that. But, you know, when they come out, the boxers would come out. And then when they're introduced, and all of the crowds are cheering for their side, booing for the other side. Usually those boxers will come out and man, they just give it like that right there. Kabam, like, you know, like, you know, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to fight it out. And this is partially what he's talking about. Not as uncertainty or beating the air. They would actually get ready and warm up and they would exercise their muscles for, for the purpose of going into that fight. And as you think about it, there's knowing the rules and then knowing the route, uh, having run the course and knowing each turn, knowing Christ will, uh, uh, for our lives, will be there for us. I think about Dr. Garris as he was talking about one time about these races and how that uh, they would try to find out the names. Many of these were slaves to my understanding. And these slaves would run for their masters in these races. And so they would write them in under an alias name. And the reason being is because it's the nature of a man on this, uh, to uh, be more in tune to listen to a woman than it is for a man to listen to a man. And, uh, you know, wives, from what I've read in uh, encyclopedias were not allowed to come to these, but uh, unmarried women were allowed to come to them. I've even read where one said that women were not allowed at all. I don't know, I'm just telling you. But I know that Dr. Garris said that those ladies on the side, as they would see and they thought they had this runner's name, would holler out, John. And what that does is when a man's in a stride and he's going about his business, He's working, he's laboring to keep up. If he hears his name, it distracts him for just one moment. And in that moment of distraction, that can be the loss of that game, or excuse me, the loss of that run, and he doesn't receive the, the crown. And so you've got to know the route. You've got to know the direction. You've got to have gone over it. You've got to have looked upon it and 
and ran it yourself and know and so forth and so on. There's no other reward. Each and every one of us have that opportunity as we have taught and as we have heard and as we have looked upon, we'll have the opportunity for the crowns that Christ our Savior gives us to cast back at his feet in honor to him for what he's done for us. It's not that we deserve any crown. He deserves it all. He deserves the praise. He deserves the glory. Galatians 3 and verse 13, but Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made as curse for us for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. And then I think in another passage in Galatians, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. But to give him that glory and to give him that honor. Can you imagine, and I might be one of those that does, but standing uh, are kneeling at the judgment seat of Christ and like a video recording, God bringing back all of our life after our conversion to Christ and what we've done for him. And then that burning up in wood, hay and stubble. You think about that. Our gold, silver, precious stone. First Corinthians, I believe it is. And you know, we'll have that opportunity. May I go on and share this with you. Uh, knowing the reward and uh, knowing that, uh, knowing the rewarder. Can you imagine, I think about Peter in John 21, and this is the first time since his betrayal, if I remember correct, he, uh, here's the Lord, children, have you any meat? And he jumps off of the boat, having toiled all night long, not received or not caught a thing. And he comes in, and as he comes into the shore, he looks into the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that Jesus may have looked at him in a condemning or a con, uh, condemning manner. I don't think that. Christ our Savior really loves us regardless. But can you imagine all of the guilt that Peter bore in his heart as he looks up to the one that loved him and gave himself for us because of his denial of Christ our Lord. Can you imagine how to be at the judgment seat of Christ when he brings out those hidden things? I don't know about y'all, but I got a lot of them. Just might as well say, man, oh me, a me, oh man. We all got a lot of them. And as we sometimes talk about, uh, uh, you know, in the closet and things like that, that are hidden in the closet, but they'll be brought to light. And then we'll stand before our master looking at him. And he will either burn those things up or to pass to us those crowns. May I say to you, there's the discipline in running. Notice with me in, uh, I didn't put it down, but in every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. There was their diet. You think about that. There's certain foods they may have loved, but they denied themselves of this because of the purpose of the run or the match or whatever they were in, uh, tossing the javelin and throwing the discus, I believe it was, and the shot put and different things like that. I think I'm correct in those, but there was more than just boxing or wrestling and more than just you know running a race at these games. And as you think about it, he says, and every man strive for the mastery. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, but I keep my body under subjection. I bring myself into this. I, you know, none of us like that, do we? Well, I like it when I go to the buffet. Y'all just might as well say, hey, man, you know, you get what you want and you leave what you don't like, don't you? My wife's got me on a keto thing. I can't tell you nothing about keto except keto. That's all I know, keto, Pluto, and I don't know. She's got me on a keto. And so I had eggs and instead of a piece of bread today, I had, I think it was a cauliflower potato cake a cauliflower cake, amen? Mm -hmm. Two little eggs and some meat. <clears throat> and 
I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to eat. And I think about those cakes and those little things in there to nibble on. And I feel the burden in the call. Amen. <laughs> they keep their burden, or excuse me, they keep their body under subjection. Let me say something else to you. You know, there's nothing wrong with the party, if you think about it. But yet, if the party lingers late into the night, that man would have to leave if he did go, or that runner would have to leave if he did go to keep his body in subjection, to get the rest that he needed, to abstain from different things, and to, uh, you know, to not partake in those pleasures. Why? I keep my body in subjection. That's why. And then may I say to you, there's the desire in running. Notice with me, and I'm going to give you this very quickly, and I'm almost through. I've got 50 seconds, amen. May I say to you, he says, lest by any means what I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You think about that. I don't want to be a castaway. I don't want to be a castaway. How many people that we're seeing, many of them are saved. And yet on visitation or you're inviting them to church or something like that, they'll look at you and they'll say, I used to go, I don't go now. What is it? I'm backslid. And they almost say that with a certain amount of pride. Oh, no, I'm backslid. Oh, no, no. Well, God knows how to beat your eyeballs out so you can see better too, doesn't he? Amen. That was a, a saying that Ed Ballou told me one time, and I never have forgot that. He said, well, son, God knows how to beat the eyeballs out so they can see better, don't they? Or doesn't he, you know, like that. And God knows how to deal with us, but can you imagine standing before the judgment seat of Christ and then receiving those crowns and those crowns and those opportunities to cast back to him, they stand there with nothing, but all they can do is watch. Think about that. Think about that. I, I know that a lot of our feelings are past, and I know that a lot of our feelings are gone after the judgment seat of Christ. I realize that uh, tears will have ended uh, on into the book of Revelation. You find that, I understand that. But can you imagine for all that our Savior has done for us and so little we have done for him? I'll finish with this thought right here. It's the only economy I know of where God will, so to speak, pay all your bills and still let you go to Shoney's, amen. What about that? Or maybe not Shoney's now, wherever you please, amen. The Shoney's and Dalton's, they're gone out. Both of them have died and gone out. But what I'm saying to you, he calls us, he provides the means, and then he turns around and blesses us all because we do it for him. All right. To the job, to the job, to the job. We go to the ministry. Amen. To the ministry. God bless. Have a good one.